All right, so you're reasonably certain that your model is bug-free. You can never be certain, but um, because we're pessimists here, but you're reasonably certain. The next step is to evaluate the performance of your model and um, use that evaluation to prioritize what you're going to do to improve it. And the way I recommend evaluating your model is by applying a concept from sort of the first machine learning class that you took, which is the bias variance decomposition. To review, um, suppose that you have some human level of performance, which is the blue line there, and then your training curve look, you know, will generally look like um, sort of a decreasing curve that approaches that blue line. Your validation curve is typically a little bit higher than your training curve, and your um, test error curve is typically a little bit higher than your validation error. And what the bias variance decomposition does is it decomposes sort of the final error in your model, so the final test error, into its component parts. And those component parts are some irreducible error that comes from you know, whatever your baseline is, right? so whatever human level performance is or whatever your target performance is. And then on top of that, you add some avoidable bias, which is also known as, um, as underfitting. And that's measured by the gap between your irreducible error and your training error. So how much worse is your training error than you expect it should be able to do? The next component on top of that is your variance, which is also known as your overfitting. And that's the gap between your training error and your validation error. So how much worse is your model doing on the, tra on the validation set than it is on the training set? And then finally, there, there might be a gap between your validation error and your test error. And so that's a measure of how much you're overfitting to your validation set. So to summarize, the bias variance decomposition tells you that your test error is some measure of irreducible error plus your bias, plus your variance, um, plus some validation set overfitting. Now there's one kind of key assumption in this, which is that your training, validation, and test set all come from the same um, data distribution. And so what do you do if that's not the case? All right, so for example, suppose that you have training data that looks like this. You know, we're doing pedestrian detection during the day, but your test data um, looks different. So your test data maybe is mostly at night. And the strategy that I recommend here is actually using two validation sets. One sampled from the training distribution, right? So maybe the training distribution might be where it's easier for you to collect and label data. Um, but then one also sampled from the test di distribution. What this allows you to do is insert another line um, into this decomposition, right? So in addition to your training error and your test error, now we have two validation set errors, one on the training validation set and then the other on the test validation set. And our bias variance decomposition now gets one more term, which is the difference between your training validation error and your test validation error. And that difference is a measure of distribution shift. So if your test validation error is significantly worse than your trained validation error, then that means that, you're, um, that there's distribution shift that's causing you to perform worse on the test validation set. Let's look at an example. Let's say that we have the following um, performance numbers for pedestrian detection. So remember, our goal performance was 1%. And Suppose that we have a training error of 20%. Right? So the difference between our training error and our goal performance is 19%. So we're kind of massively underfitting um, on this data set. Um, but the difference between our training error and our validation error is also 7%. So in addition to underfitting, we're also overfitting at the same time. And then finally, you know, maybe our validation error and our test error are about the same. So Let's say that that you know, looks reasonably good. Um, and so the question and you know, what I want to address in the next section is what do we actually do about this, right? So we're underfitting and we're overfitting. What do, like, you know, and, but we're taking this approach where we're trying to do everything one step at a time. So what is the first step that we would take to address this? Um, but just to summarize, the, I think the strategy for evaluating a model's performance is relatively simple. You look at your test error, and you decompose that into some irreducible error, some bias, some variance, um, maybe some distribution shift, and possibly some validation set overfitting. And those are the numbers that are going to tell you what to do next when you're um, improving your model's performance. 
All right, I'll pause here and take any questions. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really good question. So um, how, how much should you proactively check for um, the things like um, you know, numerical issues or shape issues that could be causing you to uh, not be able to overfit a single batch um, versus how much do you just do that reactively? I think it's sort of a hybrid. Um, I think as you get more experienced, you'll have more examples where those issues um, have, you know, have caused you pain in the past. Um, and so you'll be more careful when you're implementing your model. You know, um, oh, I know, like, I noticed that I'm dividing by a tensor here. And so like, this is a place where I could have numerical instability. And so like, let me just think really carefully about how I can avoid numerical instability um, in this operation. Um, so I think a lot of that will start to become second nature. I think um, what I would probably recommend doing is just, um, you know, you, you should be careful about things, those things when you're implementing, but it, you shouldn't, um, but you should try to get to the point where you're able, where you're attempting to overfit a single batch as quickly as possible, because that'll be a faster way to catch those bugs than just reading through your code line by line and, um, and you know, trying to guess whether you have any of those issues. What to do about distribution? So what, what to do about distribution shift between validation and test? Uh, I think I addressed that in a lecture. Can maybe if you want to clarify the question? Yeah. So I'm thinking of maybe a little test data. I mean, um, the, the particular case is you train the model on the simulation, and then you, you try to you test it on the real, real world data. And there is definitely a distribution shift between the simulation and the real world data, but you only have, let's say, Yeah. So is there, is there a way to mix in the test and do some sort of mistrapping to improve the speed of Yeah, so the question is like, let's say that you have, um, let's say that you know that you have distribution shift, but you have a very small amount of data from your test distribution. So what do you do about that? Um, I think I would still recommend the same strategy. You know, it's possible that doing something more complicated could work well, but I think, you know, the simplest thing here and probably still the best thing is, even if you only have 200 data points, um, in your, you know, from your test distribution. Well, I think it, like probably it's worth investing and in collecting more data than that. But even if I only had 200, I would probably say, you know, I'll take 100 and I'll put those in the test validation set, and I'll take another 100 and I'll put those in, the, you know, the actual test set. Um, I think it's it's very very important to have um, some sort of validation set that will give you a measure of how much you're overfitting to your training distribution. And um, uh, yeah, so I would prioritize that. If you had to choose between a moderately fitted model where train and validation errors are equal versus a model with the lowest validation error, which one would you choose? Um, I would choose, well, I don't think I have enough information to answer that question. I think in general, if you're really confident that your validation set captures the like data distribution that your model is ultimately going to be deployed into, then I'll go with the one that has the lowest validation error. Um, but I think you know that's that's a big assumption, right? And so if you're overfitting to your training set, then um, it might be the case that you like that your and your validation set doesn't contain everything that it, your test set does. Then the performance there could be even worse. I would say I would choose the one with the lowest validation error because I have an automated thing that is just going to pick it automatically out of my hyperparam feeding. <laughs> um, so uh, someone points out there's a website called Papers with Code, which mm -hmm. tracks what it says. But that reminds me of a question from yesterday that seems appropriate now, which is, is there a website or way to track approaches that didn't work? I don't think so. I thought it was an interesting idea. Yeah, I, I think a it's website, a cool idea. People contribute things that didn't work, not yeah. just things that did work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been some talk about trying to, you know, make like a 
uh, make something like this. And I think some companies try to do this internally. Um, but it's, it's really hard because it's hard to incentivize people to talk about the things that they tried and didn't work. Um, there's a question asking if you can automatically save weights of the last successful epoch. And the answer is yes. You can yeah. just checkpoint each epoch. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Great. All right. So 